this week on the Back Table Podcast. My wire uh, got stuck in a calf area, great saphenous man. And I pulled it and pulled it and, you know, I, I left a little piece. I could see it on the ultrasound. So what I did was I made a little incision, did a lot of tumescence, and then took a phlebectomy hook and then just exteriorized it. So that sort of gave me a thought about why don't we make these veins more ultrasound opaque? So I started from the next time onwards to inject foam in first, do the tumescence, and then use ultrasound. And you can actually see the hook going underneath the now ultrasound opaque vein, and you're grabbing the vein out and pulling it out. And you're actually displacing the blood in the vein by doing the foam sclerotherapy, and then you're also doing the tumescent anesthesia. So these veins come out pale, and pretty much all of my phlebectomy estimated blood loss is 2 to 3 cc's. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. At Medtronic, they take deep venous disease and patients' quality of life seriously. That's why they've committed to help you treat patients with the Abre venous self-expanding stent system. Risks include pain, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolus, and re of the stented segment. Learn more at www.medtronic.com forward slash Abre venous. And now back to the show. Today, I've got a very special episode for you guys discussing workup and treatment algorithms for severe venous disease. We've previously discussed utilizing foam sclerotherapy in the treatment of superficial venous disease, but uh, that was more for kind of milder disease. Today, we're going to take a deeper dive into the more severe disease. And I'm very pleased to introduce our guest, Raghu Kalori, coming from my hometown, Columbus, Ohio. Welcome, Raghu. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for the opportunity. This sounds like an exciting podcast. Yeah, and I first heard you speak at the Veins Conference in Las Vegas in, uh, I think it was 2017. I saw you up on stage, and that was right around the time when I was opening a vein clinic with a, an IR partner and really was super impressed. And I was looking forward to walking up and asking you some questions afterwards, but then you got just crowd mobbed by people and I never got a chance to because it was like fighting through a crowd to try and get to you. So I had always intended on on trying to shoot you an email or follow up with you later and, and then time flew by. But here we are now and I am really feel really privileged to have you on and talk about this stuff more in detail. First though, I want you to give us our audience an introduction about where you trained, where you're at, your, your current practice, what that looks like today. Aaron, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm sorry I couldn't shake your hand in 2017, man. I'm glad we're meeting now. And Backtable has become a phenomenon. Congrats for a huge success on this. I think it's very helpful for lots of people while they're driving. I hear people are listening to your podcast, and it's good stuff. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. So about me, uh, I was born and raised in India, Hyderabad, Twin Cities, Sikandrabad. And I went to medical school in Pune. India Armed Forces Medical College. And then I moved uh, to the United States following my wife, who I knew since I was 17. Um, so after I moved to Columbus, Ohio, actually Marysville, Ohio, first time in 1998, following my wife here, and we both moved to Penn State for grad school. She uh, completed her master's here at Ohio State, and we both moved to Penn State and got graduate degrees. And um, I ended up truncating my PhD into a master's degree in physiology and then came to Columbus, Ohio for Riverside Methodist Hospital internal medicine program. Following that, uh, while in the internal medicine program, actually, it was funny, I uh, always wanted to do critical care medicine. But then uh, I met my mentor and friend, Gary Ansel, who you have interviewed on Back Table, and uh, he introduced me to the field of vascular medicine uh, when we both wrote a paper called Fiber Muscular Dysplasia of Bilateral Brachialarteries. And uh, I clearly remember that he said, we need smart people outside of the cath lab. We have enough in the cath lab. I said, I'm not smart, but I'll try. So I went to Cleveland Clinic for an externship during my internal medicine and just fell in love with the field. And uh, there it is. I spent some time 
well, eight years in Springfield, Illinois, in a large cardiology practice, uh, built their vascular program. And then Gary hounded me back to come to Columbus, and then he retired. So you see how it goes. So uh, my, my car practice is about probably, I would say, 60% uh, venal lymphatic disease and um, about 40% arterial and, you know, the other vascular diseases like Raynaud's and carotid disease and medical management, dyslipidemia, PAD, and all that stuff. Apart from that, I also uh, am the system medical director for vascular medicine service line and the vascular labs at the Ohio Health System. So I manage several vascular labs for the health system and the service line for vascular medicine across the 15 hospitals of Ohio Health. Yeah, it's, it's a good mix, really, of clinic, procedures, ultrasound, and administration. Great. Yeah, I, I love that episode with Gary, you know, because he just tells a story about, you know, his, his dad wanting him to be a TV repair person, you know. Yes. It's just so great. I heard that story before. Yeah, he told me too. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah. So for the purposes of today, I want to educate our audience a little bit about uh, more severe venous disease. But just to take a step back, let's talk about how you know we look at both superficial and deep venous disease and how we classify it, right? So if you could just uh, inform our audience on you know like a quick definition and review of the SEEP classification for those that are uninitiated. Yeah, so venous disease, as you know, Aaron, um, CVD is this whole spectrum of chronic venous disease, and symptomatic portion of the venous disease is called CVI, or chronic venous insufficiency. And the CEAP classification that you're talking about, Aaron, again, is the clinical, etiologic, anatomic, and pathophysiologic. It takes a long time for us to discuss this whole spectrum of the CEAP, but let's concentrate on C because that just is the you know scope or the severity where we talk about what the patient stage of venous disease is, sort of like NYHA class 4 congestive heart failure, right? So uh, just like Rutherford classification for PAD, venous disease also has the SEEP classifications ranging from 0 to 6. 0 is no venous disease. Six is an active ulceration. One is spider veins and reticular veins. Two is varicosities. Third is when you start having venous edema. And then C4 has three components to it. A is skin changes, taste of dermatitis, etc. B is the lipodermatosclerosis. And then C5 is really healed ulceration. And C6 are, uh, which is basically recurrent ulceration. Um, and I forgot to mention in the C4, there's a corona phlebectatica, which is C4C. Yeah, it gets it gets detailed. But like you said, it's, it's a great way to basically classify patients based on presentation and what their symptoms are and, and determine, okay, what, what is the next course of action in terms of workup and treatment. And so for the purposes of today, we want to focus on the severe disease. And so would you consider that C4 and above? When you think of severe disease? Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's a good question, Aaron, because C3 could be really bothersome, right? I mean, if it's edema, but we all, as you know, believe that C3 is more of a varied spectrum of, you know, multiple factors resulting in edema. But once you take care of all those other non venous issues, it's sort of moderate range venous disease, but certainly. Once you enter the lipodermatosclerosis, recurrent eczema, the coronaphlebectatica, which are pre-ulcerative lesions or can result in venous hemorrhage, and of course, venous ulcers obviously are the most severe form. So yeah, you're right. C4 through C6 is what I would consider the severe disease. So now that we're focused on that, let's start with your workup. And, and can you just tell us how those patients are typically presenting to your practice? Are they coming from a wound care center, from just family practice docs? There's a variety of different channels. So it's, it's a variety of different channels. First off, let's step back and, you know, I, I want the audience to know that why you're talking about severe venous disease with me, because that's my passion. And about 60 to 70% of patients that I see for venous disease are C4 through C6. I see very little of the cosmetic aspect. Majority of my patients come from a diatrist. Uh, wound care centers. And then from the hospitals too, 
the uh, overlap syndrome, such as phlebolymphedema that end up in the hospital with cellulitis or broken skin, and you know they don't know anywhere uh, where to go. Primary care physicians don't know how to handle. Right. So they send these patients into the hospital, and then once they are in the hospital, they get their IV antibiotics. Then they are referred to me by the hospitalist as outpatient too. That sounds like a great practice, by the way, because you know having had a vein clinic, I really enjoyed treating the more severe disease, the C4 and above, way more satisfying than the cosmetic stuff. It's very rewarding. Um, as a matter of fact, I trained one of my interventional cardiology partner in venous procedures, and he came in with me to the wound center because I practice in the wound center too. And once the wounds heal, these old women giving me hugs and everything else, he's like, I don't get this love even after fixing someone's STEMI. So yeah. It's very yeah. rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's because those, those ulcers can be just disfiguring and debilitating, right? And so long lasting. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. They, many times they've had it for a long period of time. They can't fit their shoes on. I mean, it's just really bothersome. So you mentioned the wound care. So are you, are you actually practicing wound care as well? Yeah. Yeah. I will always practice wound care. Not as much as in the past once I took on the administrative role, but uh, yeah, in the past when I was in Springfield, I used to be in the wound center for two full days out of the week. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, we did a prior episode on that because, you know, some docs, you know, they see this need for wound care in their community, you know, especially when you start treating, you know, PAD and venous disease and they realize, well, maybe I should go get trained up in wound care and participate and that helps with the follow-up, the continuum of care, and, and making sure that those ulcers get healed on both ends, right, from the vascular side. Did you undergo any special training for it? No, vascular medicine uh, entails uh, wound care training, at least at the Cleveland Clinic Vascular Medicine Fellowship. So that's how I got you know, fascinated by the uh, late-stage venous disease when I started practicing in 2005, really. And I got connected with Suresh Vedantam at that time uh, because we were in close proximity there from Springfield to St. Louis and, you know, started seeing these venous post-thrombotic syndrome. And at that time, it was not really that upfront. And we started talking, shared patients, and Suresh helped jumpstart our program there with the cardiologist for interventional aspect. So that's really how I started seeing the badness that venous disease could cause by being in the wound center. And from what you said, really, can you think about, you know, how it would be if the interventional cardiologist just put the stent in and handed over the care for medical management to someone else after an MI, right? I mean... Right. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I like to do it all myself, yeah. So let's say a, a C4 five or six patient presents to your office. Talk us through how your workup goes with that patient. So first is thorough history, just, you know, med school basics. Um, I've always done that. And the other piece, even before I walk in, Aaron, is to look at old axial imaging, even x-rays. And not infrequently, just last week, I walk in and I say, hey, when did you have that Dewey's clip? Uh, and they didn't have any clue about that. You see what I mean? But you can clearly see on the CT. So, and general radiologists may not even mention that. So I review those images and then sit down with the patients and, you know, talk about their history. Even if they don't have a DVT, the most important aspects in the history taking here, and I believe is to ask them if they were involved in any major trauma or were it to the ICU. I mean, in Illinois, I used to have people who uh, worked in coal mines and would specifically ask, did you fall in the coal mine? And I had, you know, half a dozen patients who had sacral fractures that resulted in uh, external obstruction due to the osteophyte formation. So history is the key from where you are, uh, at where you're practicing, and, you know, all of those type of things. And Two weeks ago, I walked in, and when did they put that filter in? And the person had no clue because it was on the chest X-ray plain film. You know, just the tip of it was visible there. So, so yeah, good history, axial imaging or any radiologic imaging before you walk into the patient's room, and um, you know, after that, I will order a venous insufficiency study. 
Because right off the bat, you know, if, if the patient has a history of DVT or has a foreign body, I'm just going to say foreign body because I've seen everything from stents to filters to Dewey's clips to whatnot, right? Or, for example, anterior spine fusion. I've seen screws drilled straight into the iliac vein. So I'm sure you have too. All of those things, you know, drive me more towards deep venous, you know, workup and those type of things. But if the patient's history is more benign, when I say benign, you know, non-thrombotic, but still has the venous ulcers and stuff like that, I'm thinking more on the superficial lines. Because as you know, pretty superficial disease when it's extensive can cause significant havoc and you could really help those patients by fixing just the surface veins too. Yeah. When you have like, say, a C6 patient, what percentage of the time would you say that there's deep disease responsible for that? So yeah, Bill Marston's paper, granted it was not IVIS-based paper, it was axial imaging paper that uh, sort of looked at all venous ulcer patients and three uh, independent risk factors um, that predicted iliac vein obstruction or deep vein disease, if you would, were women, previous history of DVT, and hormone therapy. So I still use that in the background for my patients when I see them. But then the first thing I do before even thinking about that is to first line in the management in my patient population is a venous insufficiency study. So then we stratify. If there is deep venous reflux, okay, if the person is a woman and or birth control pills or history of DVT, then if the patient body habitus is acceptable in in our lab, it's up to two, 200, 250 pounds, you know, or how Midwest is. So we still can get away with, you know, reasonably obese patients with uh, iliac vein duplex itself. That's how we stratify. If we think that we won't get a good image, then we go for axial imaging. Always in our hospital at Riverside, it's CTV. I'm not impressed with um, the MR quality around here. It's so variable. And I, you know, as a radiologist, I've tried multiple times with trying to narrow in on a protocol, but I think it just depends on the patient's hemodynamics at the end of the day, you know. But uh, so I, I did have a couple of questions. I was I was talking to our mutual friend, Krishna Manava, yesterday about this, and, and he had some questions for you. So I'm just going to throw some questions from him. When you're working up superficial versus deep venous disease, and you have both, right, how do you make a decision on, on the appropriate treatment to start with? That's a fantastic question. In, a, in severe venous disease from C4 to C6, uh, my go-to is actually fixing the deep venous disease. Okay. Yeah, first, because most of these patients have significant other morbidities, right? By the time there's C6. And in the earlier forms for mild edema, I'm totally, you know, anti-fixing that uh, Mayther lesion, but C4 through C6, I believe that is the first step. And then what we do is we start, you know, good compression therapy in the wound center. And maybe, you know, six weeks to three months later, I actually repeat that venous insufficiency. And I'm surprised how many times that venous reflux actually corrects itself too, or becomes, becomes insignificant, meaning it's no longer the SFJ that's refluxing, no longer the thigh that's refluxing, and maybe just the calf area, uh, saphenous vein is refluxing with some tributaries, which could be taken care of by just local foam sclerotherapy, which I am a big proponent of uh, in, in severe venous disease. Uh, yeah, no, that's super helpful. And so I know you do some interventions. Are you also performing the deep venous interventions? But when we say that, be, you know, stent placement or balloon angioplasty? No, I, I don't. It's probably a colleague in your group that you send that person to. Well, we we have a big group. Pretty much all the seven of our, our guys are very good with venous interventions. They're interventional cardiologists like Mitch Silver. Michael Jolly, Chris Huff, Joe Campbell, John Phillips, Chip Body, all of them are very, very good uh, deep venous interventionalists. When Gary was there, he would too. He would too, yeah. So that patient, let's say they, they had a, a narrowing, whether it was a, you know, a spinal screw or a filter or something like that, maybe they even required some you know, IVC rate canalization from chronic DVT. 
they treat that and then they come back to you, you do a follow-up. Uh, sorry, what, what was the time period you said? About six weeks to three months, I try. Because th these ulcers are months old, right? I mean, I, I always say this is not acute venous disease. The name itself has chronic venous disease, right? So we give time and I talk to the patients and I tell them, hey, you know, let's just wait until we take care of this. I think that's a great point. I think that's one of the biggest challenges with treating venous disease is a lot of times the patients, even though it's been there forever, they want immediate results after treatment, right? And it's it requires a lot of counseling and almost like therapy, like just, hey, we're going to get there. It's a step-by-step -step process. That and the anticoagulation duration of DVT or PE, every patient takes a minimum of 30 minutes for me. Oh, wow. For those two reasons, like you said, you have to, there's a lot of counseling that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Chris Pittman, which I'm sure you know from- mm -hmm. I met him yesterday. The Venus World. Yeah. I'm sure he was, a, it was an AVLS, right? Correct. Yep. He says once a vein patient, always a vein patient. Uh, it's kind of, it's basically a chronic disease, you know? Yeah. There is no cure. I tell that to my patients at the outset itself, that whether it's lymphedema or venous disease, varicose vein disease, uh, there is no cure for it. It's a progressive disease. I tell them when I say this, it's not like cancer, but just remember that, you know, we take care of things that are bothering you now, uh, but you might need to come back. Uh, Steve Elias and I talk about palliative sclerotherapy for uh, these patients with severe LDS, lipidermatosclerosis, and I do that a lot too. They keep coming back, you know, every couple of years. They form new veins under the LDS, and that becomes painful. We do a little bit of sclerotherapy, and they feel better. Some of them start having atrophy, blunt ulcers, so we give, again, a little bit of sclerotherapy. They improve. So it, this is all a sort of anecdotal experience from us who take care of this severe venous disease a lot uh, in our practice, but nothing is published yet. I don't think our talk is uh, uh, evidence-based <laughs> medicine, though, right? I mean, that's what I'm looking for, right? The pearls and the anecdotal information, and which is, is, is valuable as well, right? I mean, that's how we learn a lot of stuff. We call it the meeting after the meeting, where we're just kind of hanging out and, yeah. and yeah. sharing pearls. So let's keep working through this hypothetical. So one hypothetical is they went, got the deep venous disease treated. They came back to you a couple months later. There's still superficial venous disease or they didn't have deep venous disease and they're presenting to you for superficial venous treatment, where are we now? Where, what is your algorithm? Uh, what are your treatment options for these patients? Yeah, so the treatment options really, um, Aaron, are, are the way I look at it is, are the patients high risk for venous thrombosis, okay? If the patients are high risk for venous thrombosis, by the way, I use radiofrequency, laser, varathena, Sinoaclet, you know, all of those. If the patient's VTE risk is high, automatically my choice of using varathena goes down because you can't have, you know, real precise control over, you know, how you treat that vein. Granted, I use varathena significantly in my practice, but that's not the type of patient I would want to use it. In the patients with significantly high risk for VTE, and, you know, we do a checklist for sinoacrylate allergies, for example. You probably heard about sinoacrylate related allergies. And we also do a skin test if we want. And in the patients with very high risk for VTE, I have used um, uh, sinoacrylate more because, you know, less pokes, less injuries, you know. And even from the pivotal studies, the risk for VTE is so low with sinoacrylate, I'd use that. But otherwise, you know, my workhorse, if you would, is radiofrequency ablation in these patients. Now, Erin, if in these patients, if the veins are post-thrombotic and, you know, there is no contiguous great saphenous vein from the ankle to the junction, but they still have the severe disease, you have fixed the deep venous disease as much as possible, then there are a couple of ways to take care of it. What I um, have been doing lately is I use a 15 centimeter cook needle to basically sharp recanalize, meaning skewer the vein from, you know, mid thigh all the way to the junction, and then put a sort of a stiff four French or five French sheath in. And 
Then I started using the 400 micron laser that you can simply pass through that gently. No other sheets required. You lock it and then, you know, you slowly pull back approximately a centimeter per every 10 seconds. And I just did one last Monday. That's why it's fresh in, in my mind. And then I do another segment maybe from, you know, the knee to the mid thigh and then take care of the rest with Sotradecol. Uh, which is my go-to foam for the severe venous disease patients. So it sounds like you have a lot of tools in your armamentarium that you basically can customize for each individual patient, which is great because I think a lot of people out in practice think that you have to just choose one and do that for every patient, which is not, it's not ideal. I don't think it's good patient care. I think like you said, there's different cases where things are considered most useful and most effective and efficient and, and others where they're not. And I like what you were saying about Varathena because it does work well in the right patients. Same thing with glue. I was always hesitant to try the glue because of the, at the time, I think it was like a not insignificant allergy rate. And so I was like, hey, I don't, I'm so comfortable with RF. I'm just going to stick with RF. And I think if you're doing allergy testing and you're confirming, okay, this patient's not going to have any issues with it, then it probably is a great option in that patient. So I, I like, I love hearing about your algorithm. I, I wish more people would do that and get trained in everything so that it is more patient specific. No, I, th I think, you know, I, I see a lot of patients who become sort of no option patients um, because the other venous specialists in town or in the area don't want to touch them. And Having the thrombosis background sort of gives me a little bit more comfort, too, in dealing with them in terms of periprocedural anticoagulation and those type of things. So that, I think, just adds a little bit of comfort for doing these complex procedures. But I do strongly believe that each one of these technologies, you know, has its strengths. I mean, laser for perforator ablations, for example, it's, it's just perfect. Or off-label use of cyanoacrylate glue for uh, the perforators in folks you are already doing, you know, axial treatments. It works great. For that case in particular, I remember when I was doing the glue training, they even actually said that if you're placing the glue, you could watch it under ultrasound kind of flow into the perforators as you're treating the truncal disease. Is that what you find to be the case usually? Or do you have to go in later at a different time? So, so it depends, right? I mean, if the perforator is a saphenous perforator, meaning it is connected to the saphenous vein, you mark it on the skin and then you basically give additional glue and actually literally push it from the skin surface and it'll go in sort of from a divot, if you would, right where the perforator is and that's where you want it ablated. But on the other hand, if it is not a saphenous perforator, it's coming out and, you know, connected to a reservoir of other varicosities, then what I do is I just take a 15-gauge needle, pre-fill it. Of course, the ultrasound skills have to be really good because I, I don't use any sonographers. I just do everything myself. And I have to hold it and make sure that I'm in and then, you know, wiggle the needle a little bit, make sure that it's in the perforator, give a tiny bit and compress and then see if the flow is gone or not. And I think, you know, uh, I wish there was a perforator kit for <laughs> for it, but direct injection requires a lot of good ultrasound skills. Yeah, that's that's so true. I never tried the RF ablation for perforators because I just found it to be too cumbersome. And I always just trusted my ultrasound skills and foamed those perforators and just watched directly and just kind of was very careful. But I, I, I like the idea of, of the glue as well for those. Question for you. So I guess same thing with perforators. It just depends on the case, depends on the anatomy, and it depends on probably what you're using for truncal disease in that case. Is that, is that fair to say? Absolutely. So it's, uh, am I doing it concomitantly or am I doing staged? For example, um, in the terms of perforator treatment, Aaron, every time I do a perforator, it's always associated with foam sclerotherapy of the reservoir veins because I believe that gets the best result because you have to take care of the perforator and, and those uh, reservoir veins. As a matter of fact, this past Monday, one lady's insurance didn't cover the foam sclerotherapy, so Monday we did it perforator, and Tuesday she she said, I'll pay for my sclerotherapy. So 
she paid the sclerotherapy session, you know, out of pocket, and uh, we fixed that. So I'm always a big proponent of having foam sclerotherapy in conjunction with axial or perforator treatments. And do you ever perform phlebectomy? Oh, yeah, quite a bit, actually. That's a common question that I hear is, okay, if you do it, A, how do you get trained up on it if you don't already know how to do it? And B, when is it indicated versus just doing these other standard endovascular treatments? So the tortuous veins, the endovascular treatment available is just foam sclerotherapy or varathena, right? And, uh, you know, regardless of what proponents of either one of those say, uh, the more you do these patients, the more you realize that they end up with phlebitis. They uh, will end up with, you know, green staining along those large varicosities. And the other piece is, you know, these veins may be connected to the deeper veins. And, you know, the reservoir is so big in these varicosities that the foam limit of 10, if it's physician compounded or varathena of 15, is generally not sufficient. And post-procedural compression, if need be, could be done, but it should be done for four weeks, right? I mean, that's the varathena requirement. And how many of our patients do that? And especially if you're practicing in Dallas, I mean, that would be pretty hard in summer, right? So that's one reason. And the other reason is cosmesis-wise. Of course, Asian Indians and Blacks scar quite a bit, so I try not to use phlebectomy in those populations. Keloid formation is quite high, so even the three millimeter phlebectomy scars can, you know, become keloid-like, and people don't like that at all. Um, so apart from that, the phlebectomies that I do when they come back in one year, they actually have to search for those scars. So it's a very cosmetically pleasing treatment. Now. We're going a little bit from severe disease to now cosmetic aspects of it. The symptomatic C2s and the C3s after you have completed your uh, edema uh, stuff. But if it's in C4, C4 through C6, and, and if, the, if I think that I can get away with doing foam sclerotherapy at the time of the axial ablation, and I do tumescent anesthesia even for the foam right after I inject the foam so that it shrinks those veins in the C4 through C6. But phlebectomies, I do quite a bit. Manjgoel, the Evra PI, and I published uh, our technique. I first reported it at Link, I think, in 2015 or so, where I started doing foam and ultrasound-guided phlebectomies, and this is published as a technique paper in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery, I think, in 2020 or 2019. In 2006, I still remember I went to a conference, a Venus conference, and one of the most experienced um, Italian Venus specialists uh, was talking about phlebectomy, and I raised my hand and I said, so how do you know if you're pulling out a cutaneous nerve versus a vein? And, and his answer was, um, well, if the patient screams bloody murder, you stop. And I'm like, wow, that's not one, that's not the way I should be practicing. So uh, there was this one time my wire uh, got stuck in a calf area, great saphenous vein, right? And I pulled it and pulled it and, you know, I, I left a little piece. I could see it on the ultrasound. So what I did was um, I made a little incision, did a lot of tumescence, and then took a phlebectomy hook and then just exteriorized it. So that sort of gave me a thought about why don't we make these veins more ultrasound opaque? So I started from the next time onwards to inject foam in first, do the tumescence, and then use ultrasound. And you can actually see the hook going underneath the now ultrasound opaque vein, and you're grabbing the vein out and pulling it out. And the nice thing about that technique, Aaron, is um, that we call it uh, a sclerotherapy-assisted phlebectomy, SAP you're actually displacing the blood in the vein by doing the foam sclerotherapy, and then you're also doing the tumescent anesthesia. So these veins come out pale, and pretty much all of my phlebectomy estimated blood loss is 2 to 3 cc's. It's kind of you know very nice, elegant procedure if you do it that way. I got to say, that is the best tip I've heard in, in years, like ever, <laughs> probably, when it comes to me. I mean, 
You're right. Thank you. Why did we not do that? Why are we doing? Every, why Why are we just going on visual? Like you're literally going fishing, right? You're like fishing in their subcutaneous tissues for this vein. I mean, that's the way I was taught to do it. And and you know, you're not always pulling up something that is the vein, and <laughs> that makes so much sense. Like we're able to inject foam under ultrasound. Why can we not get that hook? Uh, around the vein under ultrasound. I think that's brilliant, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. I love it. And again, you know, I practiced in Illinois and uh, and Ohio, and um, the technique I started was in Illinois. And you're right. I mean, I used to do those train tracks, put circles, and this 300-pounder who was once laying on the bed, everything is shifted, right? And then you're fishing in the wrong place anyway. So <laughs> so now I don't even mark anymore. I just find a vein. I inject a polydocanol 1% and uh, just spread it around a little bit. And then, you know, the nice thing is you don't have to do extensive phlebectomies. The smaller ones will be foam sclerotherapy, you know. Yeah. And it, like you said, it helps prevent that post-sclerotherapy phlebitis because you're just pulling the vein out. It's gone. So there's not going to be a phlebitis. Right. It's on the table. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and get inflamed all you want. You're on the table. Exactly. That's amazing, man. I love that. I'm going to move on to how do you manage patients with coexisting lymphedema or diabetic or infected ulcers or even coexisting PAD? So I just did this lecture yesterday in New Orleans at AVLS, and I said that if the patients have peripheral artery disease, whether it's moderate to severe, and they have venous ulcers, they are ischemic ulcers, okay? So uh, treat the arterial disease first so that, you know, we can either compress it, you know, or take care of the venous disease later on. The other piece, the pearl that I have for our listeners is, you know, this would be counterintuitive, but I like to spare the saphenous veins unless they're dilated, they're not good for a conduit. Right. If it's refluxing saphenous vein, even if it's like five millimeters, six millimeters, that's better than you know PTFE for a below the knee bypass. Right. So um, I actually try to spare the saphenous veins because, in my experience, you know, when people keep ablating the veins left and right, I've had you know two patients in the last two years who did not have good vein conduit and they failed percutaneous interventions and ended up having BTK. So do you address that in your workup? So let's say somebody comes in and they're like, you know, early 50s, but they have extensive coronary artery disease history and they're like a C3, C4. Do you ever say, hey, man, I want to save these saphenous veins for you? Absolutely, I do. Um, and the other thing, Aaron, that we generally don't discuss or report um, is, you know, if we see a lymph node in an ultrasound, we report it as an incidental finding. You know, I don't think any lab reports atherosclerosis in the arteries on a venous duplex, right? So I look for that when I'm looking at venous insufficiency studies. If there is, you know, atherosclerosis in the bilateral lower extremities, then, you know, my whole discussion about that is going to be different and I get an ABI and those type of things. Yeah, really good tip. Solid point for good, you know, long-term care for that patient. And you're right, on a standard DVT study, nobody remarks on the extensive PAD that a lot of times you see. You're seeing the artery and vein being compressed, but I never see concomitant atherosclerosis noted, uh, incidental finding. I put that in if I read it, you know? Yeah. And and like Kumar Manasari says, it, PAD is the cancer of the vessels, right? I mean, it's just- Right, it is. It is. It should be an incidental finding for sure. Okay. Well, so we already covered wound care. Let's talk about lymphedema real quick. I assume you treat those patients as well? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a couple every day. So the, the overlap is a difficult one in the time frame to discuss, Aaron. In Columbus, the beautiful thing is uh, Stephen Dean, my uh, colleague, uh, vascular medicine from OSU, has this phenomenal um, lymphedema center at OSU in Upper Arlington, actually. And they do such a good job. What we do is we diagnose lymphedema. We work with their occupational therapists. Again, the counseling piece of there is no cure for lymphedema, you got to do this on a daily basis, all of that stuff for 30 minutes first, and then we refer our patients to the occupational therapist, and then the patients keep coming back to us every so often, every few months. 
half of them fall through the cracks and then come back, you know, later on. They're in a worse situation, but it requires patient compliance and sitting down with the patients and drilling it to them that this is not going to go away. You're going to have honeymoon periods first. It will come back with a vengeance if you don't take care of it with manual lymph drainage techniques, massage techniques, daily compression, lymphedema pumps. Um, we use extensively depending on not a particular brand per se, but whatever uh, the patient sort of again fits with. The OSU Lymphedema Center does a very good job um, in terms of trying to fit the patients in you know multiple different types of lymphedema pumps. And then I sign off on whatever fits the best. And then we continuously counsel them every uh, so many months, generally about six months. Um, I, I see my lymphedema patients once every six months for a couple of times and then once a year if they behave. Just curious, in your practice, what percentage of the time with severe venous disease are you seeing concomitant lymphedema, you know, lymphatic issues? Yeah, flebo lymphedema is insanely, insanely common. Steve Dean's um, publication, I believe, two years ago from JVS uh, Venus and Lymphatic, you know, previously we used to think that in the rest of the world, uh, filariasis is the most common cause of lymphedema, as you know, and uh, in the United States, it was cancer. But his study of, I think, 440 patients in Columbus, the most common cause, secondary cause of lymphedema was venous insufficiency. So combined venous insufficiency and lymphedema is, I think, more common than we think. Probably in my practice, if you ask about 30 to 40%. I mean, I think that was kind of part of the struggle we had uh, in our practice was who's a good lymphedema specialist in the area to help out with these patients and not everybody has, you know, good resources. Do you have any suggestions for people? Yeah. So Lana, uh, uh, Lymphatic Association of North America has their own website and they have a network and you can put in your zip code and, you know, get the uh, local lymphedema therapist. If you don't have lymphedema therapists in your area, like that's what we did, Aaron. Initially, we wanted to start our own lymphedema center. But then, you know, Steve Dean did such a fantastic job. You know how it is in Columbus. You know, there is OSU and then there is Riverside, right? So uh, we crossed that 315 freeway to send our patients to the other side of the 315 because they were doing such a good job. And there was enough business, I would say, that we are very, very happy with that arrangement where you know, patients can come back to us. So what my recommendation would be is to find a lymphedema center in the city and then you know, talk to the medical director like I did with Steve, my friend, and you know, we take care of our patients. I think that's super helpful because it, it can be challenging. There's and there's some people out there that claim to be doing it but not doing such a great job. So it's not foot massage. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point actually because I always ask the patient what they're doing when they come back, and that tells you if they saw the right lymphedema therapist or not. Yeah, are they are they just selling pumps, you know, and not really exactly? Yeah, that's the other yeah. thing. Well. I want to talk a little bit about follow-up. We talked about them coming back for superficial treatment. We talked about these patients being basically chronic patients. But what is your compression algorithm after you've done a treatment? So, Aaron, as we talked about, there's no cure for superficial venous disease. I tell all of my patients that, you know, while there is no data, that compression therapy prevents the worsening of venous insufficiency. We don't have that natural history studies. But we all think that it would. It makes sense, right? That graduate compression does. So I tell my patients that they have to make that lifestyle switch because once a vein patient, like, you know, Chris Pittman said, they are always going to be a vein patient, right? A lot of people don't like that. But, you know, when I show them that, you know, I wear compression socks myself and I've been doing that for the last 15 years, that makes a difference for them. Um, as humans, you know, unless we are uh, manual laborers, most of us are in 71 degrees under fluorescence for most part of our lives, right? Indoors. So it, it is possible, at least, you know, by definition, the compression sock trials uh, define it as 85% of the waking hours. So I bargain, I say, you know, even if you were 60% of your waking hours, you know, that's enough. And, and in terms of the cadence, 
After I do the procedure, I, I see them. Typically, my procedure days are Mondays, and I, uh, I have them follow up uh, with our nurse practitioner on Friday with an ultrasound to make sure. This is only because my patients are complex. Now, there's a whole debate whether that's uh, even required, but because my patients have clotting history and all of that stuff, that's my thing. Four days and then six weeks and then yearly after that, and generally these yearly visits are quick. If they start having any new symptoms, then, you know, we repeat that venous insufficiency study. Yeah, I like that tactic of showing them your socks. I, I started doing that in the wintertime when it wasn't so hot in Dallas. And I remember I got a couple pairs when I was at the Veins conference and they had the logo on them. And I would pull my scrubs up and show them in clinic, say, hey, I wear them. They feel like somebody's giving me a hug all the time. And, you know, it takes a little bit of that, right? Because they moan and groan and nobody wants to have to wear them. But, you know, what weight are you usually suggesting or does it depend on the patient and their, their disease? 20 to 30 is what we recommend, unless the patients are older and they're unable to pull up the socks. And for them, I would say 15 to 20. But I clearly tell them not to wear Amazon brands. I mean, we all probably get a couple of boxes from Amazon every day, but I recommend not to use Amazon brands. Because I believe there is some engineering that goes into how these socks are spun, you know, and uh, to have that graduated compression. And I've seen lots of complications with these purported 20 to 30 on Amazon. And I tell my patients, if it is less than $40, it's not worth for venous disease. So that's my pearl for my patients, that if, if you're spending less than $40, it's probably not worth it. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the specialty recognition of vascular medicine. Anything that we're leaving behind in terms of severe venous disease that you think would be good for the audience to hear? Well, the appropriateness. Aaron, um, <laughs> yeah. the appropriateness and not ablating every single vein that is refluxing, treat the patient and not the vein. There's so many times uh, where patients come in and they've been recommended 13 procedures and they may need one. And uh, it's become a sad state of affairs in some practices. And I strongly recommend against that. Yeah. I mean, just to touch on that a little bit, you know, we have seen that here in Dallas. There's a lot vein clinics, there's docs being trained that they can just do it in their office as a family practice doc, right? And, um, you know, not to blame industry or anything, but I feel like, you know, certain specialties are being trained just to get the volumes out there, right? To sell catheters. It is. I mean, I, as humans, there are culprits everywhere, right? In every specialty. There are very conscientious, you know, family practitioners and, you know, not so much. And there are some culprits, you know, in, in IR vascular surgery, vascular yeah. medicine and cardiology, right? So, For sure. Um, For sure. So I, I think it's ultimately the physicians themselves and it's, it's hard to control this behavior. But I tell my patients that if somebody is recommending more than two procedures, get a second opinion. When people ask me about their families in other states or whatever, that's what I typically tell my patients. Um, get a second opinion if you're being told that you need more than two or three procedures. Yeah. 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 And, and the other thing that I like to throw out there, as I've learned about myself, it's not good to just dabble in procedures or pathology or service lines because you're not doing those patients any good. And, um, you know, IRs like to think that we can do everything, but, you know, we're seeing more subspecialization within IR because people are, come out and they have a real passion for PAD, right? Or they have a real passion for intermedial oncology, or, or you just have a real passion for hospital IR where you're just doing abscess drainages and neft tubes. And that's great too. That's pretty much what I do. And I like it, you know? And so I feel like if you don't have a real passion for whether it be deep or superficial disease or both, then just let somebody else do it let your group do it. It's not worth the whatever extra revenue to your practice when you have bad patient outcomes because you don't really know what you're doing, you know? Yeah, true. I mean, it really harms the patient, right? I mean, that goes everything against why we went into the medicine field and understanding that disease process, falling in love with that disease process, not the interventions. You see what I mean? Um, I think that's key 
rather than, you know, having this as a revenue stream on the side, uh, whether it's a family practitioner or a general cardiologist or a physiatrist, whatever it is. You see what I mean? I, I don't think that should be the case. It should be, you, you need to jump in with both feet, you know, into the disease state and make sure that you care for the patients, that's all. Yeah. Well, along those lines, I want to hear more about the specialty recognition for vascular medicine because you have a, a unique training pathway and, you know, you, you were telling me that's not already ABIM certified uh, as a specialty. So tell our audience a little bit more about it since we're predominantly an IR audience with some cardiology and some vascular surgery and our audience is growing, but I do want to educate everybody on the, the specialty of vascular medicine. Yeah, so uh, you heard my training pathway up front. could be an internal medicine, vascular medicine, or some are cardiology, vascular medicine. Uh, there was a slight difference. Um, in internal medicine, vascular medicine folks tend to do more venous disease, venous procedures, and also be in the wound care centers because you know, we're not taking care of the clinical cardiology on the wards, nor are we reading echoes. Cardiology vascular medicine folks are basically, they take care of the clinical vascular medicine piece, just like we do. They're involved in clinical cardiology, and they're involved in vascular lab, okay? So there are two different flavors of vascular medicine you'll see. You know, in terms of the IR folks, I think vascular medicine brings in a lot of value for IR or IC or even vascular surgery because I'll tell you, when, when I was practicing in Illinois, the president of the hospital called me into his office and he told me that 13% of the procedures were coming out of the 60 interventionalists and cardiologists who did all sorts of procedures, EP procedures and everything else. So because we are in the clinic, we supply the patients, right? So that's important. Then the other piece is the specialty recognition has been a challenge. And to a certain extent, um, the internists feel like their field is being broken into too many chunks. We did not receive ABIM certification about 15 years ago. We're going at it again. Um, the Society of Interventional Radiology, Society for Interventional Radiology, SIR, has been always very, very supportive of us. This time around, Paraga wrote a letter of support. Parag Patel, your president, wrote a letter of support for ABIM. ACC is supporting it, and few other uh, medicine and uh, other specialties are supporting it. It's a work in progress. I'm optimistic about it. Uh, we're trying dual pathway between sort of like critical care-ish, you know, you could be an internal medicine and critical care physician or pulmonology critical care or ER critical care. So we're trying that. We'll have to see what happens. As you know, um, ABIM itself has had its own issues in the last couple, two, three years, and uh, that, you know, throws a monkey wrench into the whole process here. So uh, we continue to work. We're hopeful. We, we remain optimistic cautiously. Well, I mean, it's an organ system, just like pulmonary, GI, endocrine. Like, it doesn't make any sense why you can't have vascular <laughs> as a specialty, you know? So, that's goofy. Well, yeah, hopefully we'll see some progress. And yeah, because you're right, I think the collaboration that, I feel like we're seeing more of it recently as we have these like vascular surgery practices, hiring IRs, you see the collaborative potential there, right? Vascular surgery being able to do open procedures and endovascular procedures, and then us bringing not only endovascular procedures, but maybe some non-vascular procedures to that practice. And it's very complementary. And so I, I could see something similar with vascular medicine, where you know a lot of times the IRs don't really have great background in internal medicine. So like the anticoagulants, you guys have that down. And for us, it's like, well, I got to think about Eliquis versus war. You know, it's, it's just... It, it takes a lot of brain energy to like sit down and, and work through all that. And that's just part of your practice, you know? True. I mean, while I, it, the collaboration is so, so important there, and I, in our, at Ohio Health, we are very collaborative. Our surgeons, I, I send surgical uh, patients, interventional patients to my surgeons, and they send these peri wound sclerotherapy to me, lymphedema to me, hypercoagulable states to me. So it, it could be so complementary. What's the saying? All politics are local. It's it's true. 
Dallas may be totally different from Columbus. There's just there's a lot of competition in these big cities, and uh, things get heated. Turf wars happen, and sometimes it just comes down to the personality. But then it's also great to see the examples where it works really well, like Jim Melton in Oklahoma with Blake Parsons and his team of cardiologists, and they seem to have figured it out. And it seems like you guys have too at Riverside. Yeah, yeah. The ra- the radiologists and us are we're in the same vascular institute. We work very closely with. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think that's a great place to put a pin in it. Thank you so much, Raghu, for for joining, and I, I appreciate the time. And uh, hopefully, I'll get to meet you one of these trips up to Columbus. We'll be up there around Christmas time. Yeah, give me a shout. Absolutely. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.